Hi, I'm Ted Wolf, presented by Guidewise. Welcome to the Implementers Podcast, where we connect you to the stories and insights of people who have mastered implementation. Why? Because ideas are easy, but implementation is hard. Join us as we uncover the secrets of successful implementation so you can conquer your implementation struggles. Welcome to the Implementers Podcast presented by Guidewise, where we focus on the topic of implementation because many people believe ideas are easy, but implementation can be hard. Today, our guest is Dr. Ellen Langer. Dr. Langer is the first woman tenured professor at the Harvard College of Psychology. And she has a new book out that we want to talk about today. It's the, A Mindful Body. And I'd like to start off, if we could, Dr. Langer, with your definition of mindfulness. Yeah, this is very important. I often just break into, you know, uh, whatever an answer to whatever the question is and use the word and realize people don't really know what I'm talking about. All right. So when people hear the word mindfulness, they often think meditation. This is not meditation. In fact, meditation isn't mindfulness. Meditation, which is wonderful, is a practice you engage in, hopefully to result in post-meditative mindfulness. Mindfulness, as we study it, is more immediate. And also, it's not a practice. Once you understand the basics, uh, which hopefully we'll get to um, this morning, mm -hmm. um, it just happens naturally. All right, so how do you become mindful? All you need to do is realize you don't know. Now, everybody teaches us, your parents, schools, speakers, Everybody gives us information where we think we know. And as a result, I, it may be easiest to understand mindlessness is where we're frequently in error, but rarely in doubt, right? That um, all of our facts are um, context uh, driven. That means mm -hmm. in some mm -hmm. contexts, that thing you thought was true may not be true. And I'll give you examples of that in a moment. But essentially, uh, two ways to become mindful. One is walk outside and notice three new things. Inside, mm -hmm. if you live with somebody, notice three to five new things about them. And what happens is you come to see that the thing you thought you knew, you don't know very well. And then your attention naturally goes to it. You know, uh, you can't make a decision to be mindful because when you're not there, you're not there to know you're not there. And 45 years mm -hmm. of research said, sadly, almost all of us are mindless almost all of the time. But the other way is just to accept that uncertainty is ubiquitous. It's the rule, not the routine. So now let me give an example. So one of the things, and I say, I've said this so often that I won't be surprised if uh, by next year, everybody in the country knows it, but sadly may still be mindless. Nevertheless, okay. The thing that people think they know. <clears throat> if I say to you, Ted, how much is one plus one? Now, I'd you, say you've two. been through this before, but you know, so you know my answer. But um, those who haven't mm -hmm. heard me speak are now going to say two. And they're going to say it's sort of, oh, God, is, you know, this is boring. What is she going to talk about? But it turns out this fact that we think we know better than anything else that we're most sure of. Um, is wrong in some contexts. If you add one cloud plus one cloud, one plus one is one. One pile of laundry plus one pile of laundry equals one. In the real world, one plus one probably doesn't equal two as or more often as it does. Not only that, most people don't realize that when you say one plus one equals two, you're using a base 10 number system. If it's a base two number system, one plus one is written as 10. Okay, but now let's just use this as an example. Mm -hmm. This is not likely to happen. But right after we finish talking, what if somebody comes up to you and says, how much is one plus one? What are you going to do? You're not going to mindlessly say two. You're going to pay some attention to the context. And then you'll probably answer, it could be two. All right. Always holding a modicum of uncertainty. Now, most of the facts mm -hmm. that people cling to come from science. And they don't realize that science only gives us probabilities. Science doesn't give us absolute facts. It says that if we to, were to repeat the same experiment exactly the same way, which we can never do, you're likely to get the same results. So that probable, you know, becomes absolute. 
And this uh, came home to me, another story I've, I've told now uh, since this book come out, came out a thousand times, but it bears repeating, I think. I met this horse about mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And this man asked me if I can watch his horse because he wants to get his horse a hot dog. Well, I'm Harvard, Yale all the way through. I mean, this is one fact which I'm quite certain, right? And I have to keep mm-hmm. myself mm-hmm. from laughing at him. And he comes back with the hot dog and the horse eats it. And that's when I realized everything I think I know could be wrong. The people um, mm-hmm. should be uncertain, and they know they don't know in many circumstances, but they're scared because they think they should know. So I'm here to free everybody. Mm-hmm. Nobody knows. And that makes everything potentially new and exciting. And you want me to stop talking so you can ask me a question. Go on. <laughs> okay, so so that's okay. It, if one plus one does not always equal two, and that's a mindful perspective, we'll say, then the rules that govern mind-body connection have uncertainty. There yes, is not everything, a certain everything rule you is have uncertain. to follow. Right, exactly. And, um, okay, okay. you know, so back in the um, ancient times, people didn't distinguish between mind and body. And then Descartes gave us mind-body dualism. Mm-hmm. And we've been saddled with that for, mm-hmm. um, you know, for too many years. And to my mind, um, progress will move along more quickly if we put the mind and body back together. And what that means then is any place mm-hmm. you're putting the uh, mind, you're necessarily putting the body. And if you think about that, that, you know, it's mind blowing how much control we have over every aspect of our lives. But can I go back just a second in trying to make clear about um, sure. what mindfulness is? So when you're actively noticing, what happens is the neurons are firing and we have many, many years of data showing that that's literally and figuratively enlivening. When you're mindful, um, mm-hmm. you're uh, aware of context and perspective. And you can have rules and routines, but they guide what you're doing. They don't govern what you're doing, as is the case when you're mindless. It's the essence of engagement. Okay. Okay, so you have, as chapter one in your book, uh, whose rules? Yeah. Why do you start out with chapter one on rules? You know, um, I don't think the order of the uh, chapters was handed down from the heavens because that, like everything else, uh, could have been otherwise. <laughs> okay. uh, but the idea of, <laughs> of rules, um, it, it's very interesting to me because people blindly follow rules without realizing that somebody created the rule. And the person who created that rule mm-hmm. did it because it was going to meet his or her, probably his needs. So an example I'm fond of using is I'm a tennis player and the rule in playing tennis is you have two serves, but why? I mean, surely it could have just as easily have been three. And if it were three, I'd be a much better tennis player because my first serve, I'd kill it. It wouldn't go in. Second serve, I could also kill it and I would learn from the first one. And then I have my follow-up blooper that, you know, is always returned, but at least I don't double fold. So, so once we realize so, that these rules aren't etched in stone, that immediately gives us um, more control over our lives and suggests in a very important way that everything is mutable. Now, if everything can be changed, um, then you become more mindful in trying to figure out which of these changes is going to work best for me at which moment. Okay. So... You establish rules. We'll say you go to a doctor, they give you a prognosis, and that becomes the rule. You start believing it. But then the borderline effect takes yeah. place. Could you explain yeah. what the borderline, yeah, the borderline effect yeah. might be? Okay, so um, it turns out that this is um, a way, uh, some evidence for the notion of mind body unity. So let me use an example. Uh, let's say, uh, Ted, you and I both take an IQ test. And you get a six. Uh, you get a seventy, mm-hmm. and I get a sixty-nine. Okay, so we're mm-hmm. both at the borderline, right? Anything under seventy, you're considered cognitively mm-hmm. challenged. Right? We used to call it retarded. So I'm um, mm-hmm. bad. You're good. But nobody in their right mind mm-hmm. would think that there's a meaningful difference between sixty-nine and seventy. Right? You could have guessed on one question. Mm-hmm. I could have mm-hmm. misread a question or sneezed or whatever. However, once we're given that label, 
everything in our lives becomes different. And I would venture a guess that if somebody came back six months later, uh, where I'm wearing that, um, you know, I can't do it, I'm cognitively challenged label, I would be uh, now mm -hmm. very, very different, very inferior to you on a host of measures that wouldn't have happened mm -hmm. if that weren't true. So the point here um, mm -hmm. with respect to disease, it's always the case that whatever tests are given, somebody is right above it. So they pass, so to speak. They don't have it. Mm -hmm. Somebody is right below okay. it and they have the disease. They start out, there's no difference. Over time, the mere label helps to create the difference. So I believe so, in some so of your example, research, you found and discovered the, that... I'm sorry, go on. Go on. You, you mentioned in some of your research, you've discovered that if the label is given where you are below the borderline, that is almost a self-fulfilling prophecy, just it is, as if become, it is above yeah. the borderline. Yeah. So if you just think about so it... So would that the be a IQ version exists. of the placebo effect? Um, okay. If you're... Um, <laughs> the placebo effect, I don't see, I don't know how you're relating it um, directly to the borderline, but the placebo mm -hmm. effect is perhaps, and thank you for mentioning it, the, the strongest evidence for mind-body unity. You know, think about it. You have to have a doctor, typically in a white coat, giving you a pill that's a nothing pill. Mm -hmm. But you believe it's something, mm -hmm. and then you get better. So it's not the pill that's making you better. That's inert, sugar pill, inert by definition. And so all of mm -hmm. my work actually has mm -hmm. been um, trying to figure out how to give this enormous control directly to people without having to go through the charade. So um, you go to the doctor, he gives you a rule, the borderline effect takes place, you're not mindful of it. All of a sudden the rule captures your mindset. But in your efforts and research in counterclockwise, you mentioned the illusion of control. Tell us a little bit about the illusion of control. Yeah, well, I talked about this in The Mindful Body. So this was the earliest work that I did. It was my PhD thesis. And um, as I'm uh, told, uh, the backbone for um, behavioral economics. And, um, you know, when I did this work, it was very interesting. I was one of the very early people to say, wait a second, most people are just not behaving rationally. That's where I started mm -hmm. now. And that was 1975. So now all these many years later, I've rethought it. And, you know, you have to realize from the perspective of the person who's talking to the slot machine or doing whatever they're doing, mm -hmm. it's not an illusion. Mm -hmm. They believe that they may be able to affect an outcome. And then when you believe that you have control, you stand taller, you pay more attention to what's unfolding, and eventually may actually end up having more control. So I think I was mistaken in calling it an mm -hmm. illusion. Okay. <clears throat> so when you have the illusion of control, you think you have control. You mentioned in, in, in your book, uh, Mindful Body, how that can actually help you sometimes and that you do feel you have more control over the outcome. And but more eventually than that, we have to decide on risk. Okay. Well, no, it's interesting. Yeah. So um, risk taking, mm -hmm. this is one of my favorites, you know, that um, if uh, you are going to pay me a lot of money to dive off this high cliff into the ocean, um, I, you, you couldn't make mm -hmm. me do it. All right. But now if mm -hmm. Greg Luganis does it, well, he's a professional, spectacular diver. He's not taking a risk. And I realized mm -hmm. that what mm -hmm. we see as a risk is when someone will do something that you yourself wouldn't do. You know, if I take a turn at 80 miles mm -hmm. an hour and you would never do that, uh, then you see me as a risk taker. But all that's happening is I believe mm -hmm. I can make it. Nobody takes an action thinking, oh, well, I may end up dying with this, even if that is the way it turns out. You know, you don't buy a stock saying, maybe I'll make money, maybe I won't. You buy a stock at that moment, mm -hmm. believing it's going to, you're going to be successful with that. So it, this becomes important because many people admire people who are willing to take risks, feel bad about themselves not mm -hmm. being, you know, being so risk averse. And uh, you have lots of gurus mm -hmm. out there who'll tell them, you know, put them through walk on coals and you can do it. Just, you know, tell yourself you can do it and get out there. And that's mm -hmm. not the way to do it. Mm -hmm. That um, if I want to 
uh, dive from that high cliff. All I need to do is learn how to dive. You know, uh, if Greg Luganis mm-hmm. and all his diving ability were given a chance to take um, a psychology test, you know, um, it would be silly for him to mm-hmm. wager uh, a lot of money, right? Because he has no special skill. Mm-hmm. For me, mm-hmm. I definitely do it, right? right? But for him to then take the test right. is not just give himself a pep talk, but to learn more psychology. So you, um, most of us evaluate things from the observer's perspective. Somebody is looking at you and they decide whether you're taking a risk. From the actors, from your perspective, uh, you're doing what you think will be successful or else you wouldn't do it. Right. So um, you mentioned the word actor. Could you talk to us a little bit about your concept of the actor participant um, mindsets, if you will, in the whole idea of risk? Okay. Well, you know, people um, often ignore the differences between doing something and watching somebody do Mm -hmm. something. And you have very different information available Mm -hmm. to you. You know, so when you're doing the action, so, I mean, the simplest example, and it's been studied to death in social psychology, is if I walk into a garbage can and you see a waste paper basket, and you see me, you decide I'm clumsy. Right. But from my perspective, I've walked Mm -hmm. past many uh, waste paper baskets without walking into them. All right. So I, there's something Mm -hmm. special about the situation. I'm not clumsy. Um, I didn't get enough sleep last night. Mm -hmm. All right. So the larger point Mm -hmm. is that the world that uh, is experienced by the person doing the action is very different from the one experienced by the person who's looking. And so with respect to this risk taking, Mm -hmm. you, you know, if you are observing this, uh, you use as a yardstick what you yourself would do. When you're doing the activity, Mm -hmm. you are presuming that it will be successful or else you wouldn't do it. You know, there was something when you asked me to Mm -hmm. come on the show again, which I was pleased to do because I've enjoyed so speaking to you in the Mm -hmm. past. um, And you said, well, let's talk about work. And there was there was something that I want to make sure I get in. So I'm just going to interrupt everything and and say it now. Um, It's very interesting to me. Who, when people who study work, who think about work, see work as separate from the rest of life, you know, and um, and mm-hmm. cut themselves off unintentionally from all sorts of information that's potentially very help, helpful. When people are at work, mm-hmm. they're the same people when they're not at work. And so all the information about how people who are not at work are is relevant. And it, it occurs to me that, you know, I recommended this to some company. I don't remember, but it, it was a long time ago um, when I was consulting to them that, you know, the people who come to work have a home life and that home life is not irrelevant to their work performance. And um, I was suggesting to them that they get their wives for their male workers. They get their wives involved so that you know, it's no longer he has to please his wife or please his boss, you know, so to speak. I mean, there are so many mm-hmm. things that change in the work setting. It's also that this book, The Mindful mm-hmm. Body, though certainly not exclusively, but has a lot of information about uh, health. Health is not irrelevant to the work situation. If you're healthy, you don't stay home and take six day, sick days that cost the company money. Um, when you're healthy... Mm-hmm. Uh, you are performing better. And so your bottom line is going to be improved. So, um, you know, anything that any business leader reads that tells them how to be healthier is relevant to how to increase the success of the business in question. So as you bring up business, a lot of business owners and managers, leaders, they really sort things into abundance versus scarcity. And that leads them into winners and losers labels. Yeah. You mentioned that in um, your, your book, A Mindful Body. Tell us a little bit more about that whole world of abundance versus scarcity and how that can actually get you into trouble if you're focusing yeah. on scarcity. So, you know, it's interesting. When I started to write The Mindful Body, it started as a memoir. And so 
uh, there when I wrote it again and again to make it what it finally became, um, I left in a lot of the personal stories. So I had had this friend um, and it was amazing to me. So for you know a silly example, but I would come home and I'd say, look, I got these sneakers mm -hmm. on sale. And she would react negatively. It took me years to figure out what was going mm -hmm. on. And then I realized that she had a view of everything being scarce. So if I got those sneakers on sale, they were fewer for other people to get. So to her, I was bragging. I have a view of the world as plentiful. Mm -hmm. So now when I'm telling her there are sneakers on sale, what I'm doing is sharing. And, you know, these, mm -hmm. these different views uh, guide a lot of our behavior. You know, there's an old story. I don't know if you know it. Uh, the shoe salesman goes down to Africa, to the darkest parts of Africa before, mm -hmm. um, uh, well, it became part of the current world. And, before shoes um, were plentiful. <laughs> that, well, he went down to Africa um, and then called back home and said, uh, sorry, uh, there's no business down here. The Africans don't wear shoes. And another shoe salesman sent by a different company goes down there, calls back and says, what an incredible opportunity. Nobody here wears shoes. You know, so the first one's saying they won't mm -hmm. buy the shoes, which he can't know. The second one is saying, oh, well, look at all the potential customers. And the larger point is that everything can be understood in multiple ways. And when you're mindless, you're sort of stuck in a single-minded way. So the person with the view of scarcity, for example, um, is always focused on uh, how to make sure they end up, you know, they don't end up with nothing. When you feel abundance, then you're able to be out in the world, mindful, exploring, learning, and growing. Uh-huh. So if you're a business manager or owner and somebody calls you and they say, hey, don't send any more shoes. Nobody wears shoes down here. And then another salesperson calls and says, send all the shoes you can because there's nobody wearing shoes down here. That manager or business owner has to make a decision. Talk yeah. to us a little bit about okay, so this making is, a decision. This is really wild. You know, I've spent years and years and years thinking about decision making. And there are so many things that just don't make sense to me, things that the experts say. And it's interesting in a different way, before I tell you the mindful theory of decision making, is I find that by and large, people are doing what they should be doing. And then the experts come along and label some of these behaviors in different ways, try to get them to behave differently. Um, and um, it, it fails, except it makes the person feel inadequate. Okay. So if you're supposed mm -hmm. to do a cost-benefit analysis, the first thing is, how do you decide to decide? How can you do a cost-benefit analysis? How do you decide that? How do you decide that? It becomes an infinite regress. But that's not really the main point. The main point is that mm -hmm. the more mindful you are, the more you know that anything that seems to be a cost could also be a benefit. Anything that's a benefit could also be a cost. You can't add them up. You know, plus one and minus one doesn't tell you what to do. Not only that, if you're mm -hmm. gathering information, how do you know when to stop? And each new piece of information could change mm -hmm. the sense of what you're doing. So, you know, I go through, um, I, I mm -hmm. try to be clear about this. It's very important. You know, people should read it in the book. Let me give everybody the bottom line. Rather than waste your time trying to make the right decision, make the decision right. Now, the main thing that, about that's decision exactly where I was making, going. Yep. Yeah. The main thing about decision making that people don't realize is that it's all based on prediction. You know, you have three out, three alternatives you're trying to decide among, all right? Or let's just make it two. Should you have an apple mm -hmm. or a pear? It's the same process if you're deciding, should I get an abortion or not? Should I buy the company or fold? You know, whatever it is. Okay. That if you're deciding, should I have an apple and a pear? The presumption that's mindless is that if I have that apple, it's going to taste like the last apple. And uh, there are so many mm -hmm. reasons why it might, in fact, be very different. I don't. That's probably not the most compelling example. But let me um, let me tell people if they don't realize it. Illusion. A prediction is an illusion. We cannot predict. 
You can't predict the individual case. So if I and anybody who wants to argue with this me with me, I'll make you a wager. Let's go to a Mercedes dealership. I'm going to see a hundred cars. Okay, best cars, wonderful cars, right? Mm -hmm. And I say to you, we're going to randomly pick any car and start it up. If it starts, I'll give you um, a half a million dollars. If it doesn't start, you give me a half a million dollars. And most people will not take that bet because they know, look, sometimes things don't work. Even the best of us make mistakes. You know, sometimes uh, it's a lemon. Right. All right. So, um, I, you know, I say to my class, this is a decision making class at Harvard graduate students. OK, I say to them, I have been coming to this class for uh, teaching this class for about 40 years. I have never missed a class. What is the likelihood that I'm going to be here next week? Okay, we go around the room, 15 people. They say ridiculous things. The first, you know, first one says 97%. How do you come to 97%? All he's really saying is that it's, he doesn't feel comfortable saying 100%, but that's what he thinks it is. So we go around and everybody, you know, basically says, I will definitely be there. Now I say, let's go around the room and each of you give me a good reason why I won't be there. The first one always says, which is amazing, um, well, you've been there all the time. You feel you should take the time off. The next one says your dog has to go to the vet. The next one says you get a flat tire. We get 12, 15 good reasons why I won't be there. Now I say, what is the likelihood I'm going to be there? And the 100% drops to 50%. Going forward, we have no idea. Mm -hmm. Looking back, you know, we're all Monday morning quarterbackers, right? Ah, I should have known that. Yeah, right. I did right. know that when going forward, you know. So um, because you can predict, um, then, and I have, you know, one liner about predictions, uh, which you probably ask me next, which is, um, you know, this, this book that you're <laughs> reading from there is The Art of Noticing, and it's my paintings paired with one-liners that were called from research over all these, you know, 45 years. And one of them says, yeah. predict today and lose tomorrow. And you know, so what that mm -hmm. means is that when you're making predictions, you're looking for particular, particular things. And the more uh, intensely mm -hmm. you're looking for X, the more likely it is you're not going to see Y. And so um, our predictions mm -hmm. blind us. In fact, everything we know blinds us. Do you know the study that Simon and Chabriz did? Wonderful study with the gorilla. This is unbelievable to people no. who have never heard this or seen it. Okay. Uh, people are watching a basketball game. And in the middle of the basketball game, a person dressed in a gorilla suit comes on the court. People do not see it. And it's hard to imagine that. Uh, but, you know, uh -huh. it's true. Yes. Mm -hmm. That, you know, that you see what you expect to see and your predictions mm -hmm. set up your expectations. And then you don't see things that you don't expect to see, which is why you're better off not making these rigid predictions and then just mindfully being there. Mm -hmm. So if I'm that decision maker, I get the two salespeople calling me and I have to make a decision. <laughs> You're not suggesting that you don't still develop plans because being mindful is I'm always noticing new and different things and constructing different alternatives. Yeah, yeah. What correct? I'm suggesting is that we there's no right answer. You know, will they buy the shoes if you send, you know, 10,000 pairs of shoes there or won't they? There's no way to know. Um, that when you create a plan, at least mm -hmm. you feel you're doing something. But my alternative to wasting mm -hmm. our time trying to make the right decision is to make the decision right. So if you don't send the shoes yes. there, uh, then you open up another market someplace else. And if that's successful, then it doesn't matter. What's right. the difference if you sell them here or you sell them there? If you send them down to Africa, right. um, you, you know, look, lots of people in this world wear shoes. There has to be some advantage to wearing them. Mm -hmm. And so then the task becomes persuading people mm -hmm. of the real advantage um, and, you know, understanding that mm -hmm. there are also advantages going barefoot. Mm -hmm. so, so the bottom line you again, say just make a decision and then make. The, OK, go ahead. You know, I'm sorry. Don't worry about making the right decision. Make the decision right. Flip a coin. I know it sounds bizarre, right? 
But since you can't predict what's going to happen anyway, why suffer all of the stress? I had my students, same class. I say, okay, I want you to spend this week without making any decisions. I want you to come up with a rule of thumb, you know, so maybe you'll take the first alternative that's suggested each time or flip a coin, but don't engage in any cost benefit analysis. They spend the week relieved, not having to make a decision. They come back and they're all more than happy with how the week went. It was easy. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, now you mm-hmm. should worry and mm-hmm. make decisions if we know that there's a right answer. But since we can't prove a right answer, then the whole process is a waste of time. I believe. So in making a decision and then making it right, you're actually becoming the actor in your life. Exactly. You become and the you actor. you are keeping a mindfulness. That's right. That's, that's so mm-hmm. important. Thank you. You know, that as you're making it right, you're noticing things, you're changing the world. And in doing that, you're changing yourself and you're growing. And, um, you know, rather than presume you can't with any of these things, or it doesn't pay to decide to do it, it's not going to work. You can never know that something is not going to work. There's no science that can prove uh, that something can't be. So you do it. And then you make it happen. So, mm-hmm. Okay, so there, you know, there are companies. And making it happen, stuff. you take one step. Go on. Go ahead. I'm sorry. We have a no, delay. No, no, okay. I'm, I get excited, so I tend to talk too much. All right. Um, <laughs> so, you okay. know, so you have a big business, and you're losing money, and you have to make a decision. You think continue, where if you do continue, you could lose a lot of money, or stop. There's no way of knowing. Uh, There's no right answer. And there have been businesses that I talk about in the book that, in fact, weathered that storm and went on to be, you know, multi-billionaire, billion-dollar companies. Um, You know, the main thing is, Mm -hmm. since you can't know, don't regret whatever you're doing. Regret is mindless. Regret suggests that that other alternative that you didn't take would have been better. There's no way of knowing if it would have been better or worse um, or the same. You know, you get invited to uh, accept it at Harvard and Yale. So where should you go? There's no way to decide. So let's say you go to um, Harvard and you hate it. Mm-hmm. Um, and then many people then, especially younger people, say, oh, I should have gone to Yale. It, it's ridiculous because that's a presumption that Yale would have been better. We have no idea if it would have been, again, better, worse, or the same. Now, the point of this, when you make a decision, it's to take some action. As soon as you take that action, you Mm -hmm. can't evaluate the sense of a decision. So now the student has come to Harvard. um, They never know, will never be able to know what it would have been like going to Yale. And the way not to regret Mm -hmm. what we do is to be mindful of why we're making the choices we're making. So, um, you know, I didn't go to the party you invited me to because I just needed to take the time off to be alone, to relax, maybe to, you know, watch some series on television and just, you know, just be by myself, okay? Then I speak to you and you tell me, Mm -hmm. oh, my God, you know, they were giving out these important positions and tons of money and I should have been at the party. I would not feel regret because I know why I didn't go. But if we're mindless and we do what we're doing without knowing why, as soon as we find out there is something good about the unchosen alternative, um, we suffer needlessly. So regret is mindless. Mm -hmm. Um, You mentioned in your book, um, excuse me, A Mindful Body, where... Um, you're in Paris and you're yeah. This is the beginning a right. lunch or a dinner, I believe. Yeah. And yeah. Let me tell the story. Right. Okay, this and, one is fun. Um, go ahead. Okay, uh, so this was one of the my, this was my first experience of mind body unity, and <clears throat> one of the uh, personal stories that I have in the book. Some you know I had mm-hmm. experiences with Hell's Angel. Mm-hmm. I mean all sorts of things that are in there to help make some larger point. But with this one, so. I'm uh, going on my honeymoon. I'm 18 years old, very young, but I'm 18 going on 40. I'm trying to be very sophisticated. So we're in Paris. We go in this restaurant. I order this mixed grill, 
one of the items on the grill is pancreas. So I then say to my mm -hmm. then husband, which of these is the pancreas? He was more worldly than I, and he pointed to that over there. Okay. I'm a big eater. I eat everything with gusto. Now the moment of decision. Can I eat the pancreas? I have to be able to eat it. I'm a married woman now, right? <laughs> All, older and mm -hmm. sophisticated. Well, I start mm -hmm. eating it, and I literally get sick to my stomach. Uh, you know, I, I couldn't uh, down it. I w was literally sick. He then starts laughing. I say, why are you laughing? He said, because that's chicken. You ate the pancreas a while ago. So for me to get so sick, you know, on chicken made clear <clears throat> that it was all in my head. And so that's what, so, you know, we have so many studies that I report in this book that show uh, how we make ourselves sick, but more important, how we can make ourselves well. So if I can use that comparison in a broad standpoint, panc uh, pancreas versus chicken. Let's talk a little bit, if you can, or explain the biosocial model of illness yeah. being germs versus mindset. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, let's explain go back. Explain that if you can. Sure. Sure. If we go back, m many people might not know this, not that many decades ago, the medical model um, uh, believed that the only way you were going to become sick was the introduction of an antigen. Okay. So, Everybody believes it's more fun to be happy than sad, but that was totally irrelevant to your health. Then things progress, <clears throat> and now people realize that stress um, is very dangerous for our health, very bad for our health, and stress is psychological, right? Um, events don't cause stress. What causes stress is the view you take of the event. But people still um, mm -hmm. haven't gone far enough. Because if you talk about mind-body connection, you still have to deal with the problem. How do you get from this fuzzy thing called a thought to something material like the body? And mm -hmm. by going the, mm -hmm. the next step here to mind-body unity, if it's one thing, you don't have to figure out how you get from one to the other. It's just one. And then we can do mm -hmm. all of the exciting studies that I report in the mindful body. Mm -hmm. So there's there's no separation between mind and body. It is oneness. It's just one to me, thing to me. And yes. If I think something, and you know, I'll, and let me I'll, let me okay. let me tell but, you that it's one thing mm -hmm. that uh, even uh, you know what what that means is that one part isn't causing the other. That's causing the next. It's all happening more or less simultaneously as one thing. And mm -hmm. that for me, mm -hmm. if I wanted to give the weak argument, it'd be that. Let's act as if this is the case because of all the improvements we can make in our lives that I outlined there, not just our health, but um, our success and, and so on. But I, I'm the hardliner. I do believe um, uh, when the dust settles, it will be best to see it as a single unit. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. So you mentioned in your book, um, when symptoms change, but mindsets don't. Yeah. So you mentioned okay. that also, if you've been diagnosed with a disease, but it no longer appears, do you still have the disease? Yeah, there are lots of questions that I thought. ask like that. Yeah, you know, because, uh, and also, when somebody has a chronic illness, what, what does that really mean? First, most people take that to mean you have no mm -hmm. control over it. But how chronic does it have to be to be chronic? Do you have to have the symptoms every day for you know twenty four hours a day? Um, if you had it every other day, once a week, you know, and all of that would change the meaning of the disease. Because if it's called chronic because you have it mm -hmm. every Tuesday, um, then all you need to do is look at what's happening Monday, Wednesday, and so on uh, when you don't have it to figure out. Uh, how to get a handle on it. Um, when we have a chronic disease, mm -hmm. the assumption is that our symptoms will stay the same or get worse. 
and nothing stays the same and nothing work, moves in only one direction. There are always little improvements, then you fall down, then you improve, and so on. If, even if you're trying to build a house, you're trying to learn how to play the violin, it doesn't matter. You're not going to, your, your performance is not going to go um, from worse to good in a straight line. So we want to take advantage of that. Mm -hmm. What is happening in the moments when you're feeling a little better? And so it's a very simple thing that we did with very big diseases. All we do is call people periodically and ask them, um, how is the symptom now? You know, let's say chronic pain. Uh, is it better or worse than the last time and why? Well, three things happen when you do that. The first by them, as soon as they notice, yeah, it's not always chronic to the same extent, you feel a little better. Second, when you start doing the mindful search, why now? Why now is it a little better than before? Was it something I ate? Was it, you know, the way I was sitting? Was it uh, that I slept a half hour more? I had an energy, you know, what was the reason? That you're becoming more mindful. And we've made clear, I think, that the more mindful you are, when you're mindful, the neurons are flowing, and it's literally and figuratively enlivening. And then finally, I believe, mm -hmm. if you are looking for a cure, you're more likely to find one. And now this could be done without mm -hmm. somebody calling. This is my alternative to the um, placebo. Because you could set your smartphone or watch, whatever you have, or just a regular alarm clock, and mm -hmm. uh, ask it to ring in, let's say, an hour and a half. And when it rings, you ask yourself, so, mm -hmm. gee, do I have the symptom now? And is it better and worse than before? And why? Then set it again to ring three hours later. And just keep doing this over the course of a week or two. and the um the findings have been amazing we did this with people who have parkinson's multiple sclerosis stroke um arthritis chronic pain i mean just you know real real big um diseases and in each case we find that mm -hmm. people are able to um remove most of the symptoms by doing this simple thing mm -hmm. So, you know, so in, you uh, asked the question my about... My own personal experience. No, go on. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm no, sorry. You, you go. No, no. I, you let me go the last time. Okay. This is your turn. <laughs> okay. Okay. In my own personal experience, my father had cancer, and through that journey, through his transition, I would come in in the beginning, and I would ask him, well, how did you feel today? How do you feel? In hopes he would say, oh, I feel a little better or something. But I, I didn't realize that I was actually taking him into that place of scarcity. Yeah. So after reading your book, Mindful Body, you have the idea that I find fascinating of mindful contagion. Mindfulness yeah. is contagious. Yeah. And you have some research examples. Could you tell us about that? Yeah. So this is wild. You know, that, um, in an earlier draft of the book, I had a chapter that I called the woo-woo chapter, <laughs> and the publishers asked me to take out okay. most of it, but uh, this stuff stayed because it's research-based. You know, the um, well, first, before I, I, I talk about it, people need to understand that um, everything we've said up until this woo-woo part you can count on as being true, all right? And if this seems too strange to you, mm -hmm. you don't want to throw the baby out with the bath and decide, you know, that uh, it's all too strange. Mm -hmm. uh, because, again, mm -hmm. we have mm -hmm. so much control over ourselves that we're not exercising. It, it's sad. Okay, so what we did, mm -hmm. well, there are several things that we did. The first, um, these I'm sure of, um, that many people... Um, are extra sensitive to other people's mindlessness. You know, we know, we don't have a word mm -hmm. for it, but when you're with somebody who's not quite there, they're not on the level, you, you know it. And we have some explanation, you know, mm -hmm. some labels. I mean, one oar in the water or the lights on, but nobody's home. Um, but that's for the people mm -hmm. who are just, you know, just mindless, not the people who are evilly mindless, mm -hmm. okay? And um, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. we're, we're made uncomfortable in the presence of somebody mindless. All right, so if one is super sensitive to other people's mindlessness, they're going to be more uncomfortable than somebody who is not super sensitive. So um, first mm -hmm. I had thought that many of the people I know who are heavy drinkers drink to dull down some of these cues. 
Um, and mm-hmm. so we did a little study. This one is not woo woo, um, where we had people in a wine test, uh, tasting experiment and the experimenter is mindful or mindless. And, uh, the, Participant is a heavy drinker, oblivious to, you know, uh, the different conditions for the experimenter. Mm -hmm. And we simply note how much they drink. And they drink much more when the experimenter is mindless. You know, what I like to do um, for all of my work is find a way that the group that we're diminishing actually may be outperforming us in some way. I I like leveling things off rather than good guys, bad guys, winners and losers. Mm -hmm. And it occurred to me Mm -hmm. that some of the people who are autistic may also be super sensitive to other other people's mindlessness, which is why Mm -hmm. social situations may be so hard for them because most people are mindless almost all the time. So again, we Mm -hmm. have people uh, who are mindful or mindless with these autistic, in this case, children. And when there was somebody mindful, they perform essentially just like non-autistic kids. All right. Mm -hmm. We have lots of studies where we show that when you're mindful, uh, people see you as more charismatic, more authentic, better Mm -hmm. leaders, more trustworthy. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's another way where the mindfulness um, is contagious in that if I trust you and I see you as that kind of nice, non-judgmental person, I'm going to relax, be more myself, and so on. In other words, I'm going to let myself Mm -hmm. put the stress of being with somebody aside and behave more mindfully. Okay, so we have Mm -hmm. lots of these kinds of studies. Then we have the really weird one. Okay, so (laughs) it's people, um, when we show people- Can't wait to hear it. (laughs) We did uh, a version of this many years ago very simple study. We just so, showed people index cards that had things written on it, like Mary had a, a little lamb. I love Paris and the, the springtime, just one statement. And we just give it to them and ask them to read it. And everybody misses, like they don't see the gorilla, that this was well before the gorilla study. They don't see the double letter. So you show it, they read it. I say, how many words are they? Go, Mary had a little lamb, five. I'll pay you for accuracy. Mary had a little lamb. They just don't see it. We showed it to people who just finished meditating and they saw it. Okay, so now, so if you see it, we're going to declare you as mindful, right? So now Mm -hmm. you come into the study and there's um, uh, somebody, a confederate working with us, okay? That confederate Mm -hmm. will be mindful or mindless. That means they're just noticing new things or they're counting, you know, the same old, same old, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. They don't Mm -hmm. say anything to you. You're then handed this card Mm -hmm. standing next to this person who's mindful or mindless. When the person you're standing next to is mindful, You see, Mary had a a little lamb. You see the double Mm -hmm. word. All right. Mm -hmm. Just being near somebody seems to have that that positive effect. In another study that's half woo and half not, we had people meditating in a room, and they could have been doing our mindfulness or, or meditating, doesn't matter. And then they leave, and then participants come into the room. Or there's nobody in the room, And then participants come into the room and we test them. And what happens is when you're in a room that had just been occupied by uh, people who were meditating, your cognitive um, performance is enhanced. There's something in the air. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. So be it. But it's all good for business. I noticed it. I mean, it's it's good for all parts of your life. I mean, if you're running a business, you don't have to teach each and every person to be mindful, you know, uh, some subset, and Mm -hmm. then it will uh, affect everybody there. And you end up with a mindful organization, which, you know, is going to be far superior on almost every dimension to the business that's being conducted Mm -hmm. right now. I found in my own experience, that's very true, because very often you might be in a business meeting and you have decision makers, quote unquote, sitting around a table. And one person just keeps asking more questions and better questions and evaluating things that other people didn't think about. Immediately, everybody's got to respond to that. So they're in effect changing their mindset. 
Yes. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. And but, they're but basically if you do guiding that, them. If, if you don't do that nicely, you know, um, where you're trying to make mm-hmm. the person who gave the last idea feel like an idiot and aren't I smart and so on, uh, because when you do it in that not nice right. way, then it, it has the reverse effect where everybody then becomes afraid to speak up because they don't want to be the, you know, um, the brunt of the criticism. Right. The outlier. Yeah. So, um, you have a quote, um, accepting certainty is the most flagrant instance of that unnecessarily limiting our free will. I think that applies to that meeting, but tell us more. What do you see in life in, in general where people are just limiting their beliefs or yeah. limiting, um, well, their you know, options? You know, they're, um, When you're mindful, you can take advantage of opportunities to which other people are blind, and you avert the danger that they don't even realize uh, is there. And so, um, Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, that's the, the major... The major difference is that when you're mindful, you have all sorts of choices. When you're mindful for reasons we didn't really go over, but people can read about in the book, you're not stressed. You recognize whatever happens, you're going to make it work. Um, when you're, when you're mm-hmm. mindful because you're so appealing to people, um, your relationships are better. Everything is better. And that all of this is denied you when you're operating based on mindless rules, when you think that you're supposed to know something and your head will fall if you don't know it, Um, when you um, let yesterday's solutions uh, solve today's problems. And, you know, so then you Mm -hmm. come up short. Mm -hmm. So, um, if nothing is certain, then that makes everything possible. Correct? Exactly. Exactly. And it's not, you know, uncertainty, as I started with, is the rule, not the exception. And uncertainty um, is scary to people when they think that means that they don't know, but they think somebody else knows. But as soon as you recognize that nobody knows, everything becomes more interesting. And everyone becomes more interesting. Mm-hmm. And uh, and we go back to business. Um, you know, I had this experience when I was doing this consulting in South Africa. I might have told you it was the last time we spoke. So if so, interrupt me. But I took an afternoon off, mm-hmm. and I'm down at the pool. And um, there's a vast amount of the hotel's real estate that wasn't being used. And the only person who knew that was the lowly cabana boy. You know, um, and by recognizing Mm -hmm. that everybody, literally, this is not in a hallmark way, you know, isn't that peaches and cream? In a very Mm -hmm. real way, Mm -hmm. everybody has something to offer. Everybody has a perspective, Mm -hmm. brings different information to the table. And if we welcome it rather than presume that if you don't have the title, you don't have the knowledge, um, uh, we would all prosper. and so that's the way, you know, one of the ways that I would reorganize business. And some businesses mm-hmm. do it now, but it's really Mickey Mouse. They don't believe it. You know, they'll have a suggestion box, for instance. So all workers mm-hmm. tell us how to improve. And I don't know if anybody even reads those. I'm talking about, you know, and, and I could go into, I think, virtually any organization. This is a big statement to say. But and figure out ways that each of the different people there has something unique that could, in fact, uh, help the bottom line. Um, yes, and, I agree with that. Um, um, I'd like to ask if I could just to step back and you dedicate the book, I believe, to your grandchildren. Yeah. What would you say or hope for your grandchildren to take from this book, guiding their life going forward? Yeah. Um, well, you know, so many things uh, that I hope. Um, people reading it take away from it. And and I hope that it becomes so part of our uh, day-to-day culture that they don't have to think about it. It's just natural for them to realize they have all of these choices. The largest idea here is that everything is mutable. Everything can be changed to better meet our needs. That when we recognize that everything can be understood in multiple ways, life becomes much more exciting. 
We don't end up with the world mm -hmm. we have now of winners and losers. Uh, to go back to the idea of scarcity, you know, it's sad. There's enough food mm -hmm. and water to feed everybody in this planet. Uh, it shouldn't have been organized, to, to my mind, where some people have so much and some, you know, nothing. Um, and I'm not saying mm -hmm. we should take everything and divide it equally. You know, we don't have to get into that. Mm -hmm. But there's no excuse mm -hmm. for, you know. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that that I, I wrote a little song that's based on what I had just said to you a moment ago from that um, mm -hmm. consulting uh, in South Africa for, for them. Mm -hmm. Um, and okay, it's basically uh, goes to the old Sarah Lee commercial. I'm not going to sing it because I can't sing, but I should sing it because that's the very point of it. All right, and I have on some podcasts. Then, then, then sing not it today, okay? <laughs> um, which okay. is everybody doesn't know something. Everybody knows something else. Everybody can do something. Mm -hmm. Everyone can do something else. And when we recognize this about ourselves, we don't get threatened when you, know, you can do something I can't, um, you know, and so on. It, it just becomes a very different life. So I became sure that this was going to be a hit tune <laughs> when uh, one of my grandkids this is a, a five years old and he says, um, he starts mm -hmm. whistling. And I say, oh, Theo, you're such a good whistler. Then his brother says, Grandma L, I was learning something else when Theo was learning how to whistle, which just sang perfect to mm -hmm. me rather than feel less than, you know, so that if mm -hmm. everybody can appreciate their own talents, understand when they do something, there was a good reason to do it um, or else they wouldn't have done it. Uh, then they're less likely to negatively judge themselves and less likely to negatively judge other people. And then everything is friendlier in an important way. And all of us get more work done um, because we're not seeing it as work. It's just, you know, when I'm writing a book or I'm teaching or talking to you, I, I'm not working. I'm enjoying every mm -hmm. moment of it or else I wouldn't do mm -hmm. it. And uh, sadly, mm -hmm. we have taught too many people that work has to be stressful. And so you can't wait till work is over on Friday or when you take your vacation. And that to me is very sad, you know, that uh, mm -hmm. to think that there are so many people spending 40, 50, 60 hours a week doing something that they don't enjoy. And I say, well, how did this whole thing come about? And so part of my goal is to try to reorganize all of it. Um, because again, well, the things that we all care for, care about, are not zero sum. We can all feel good about ourselves. We can all be effective. Um, and um, I think that that's really the bottom line. How to achieve that is by, in part, becoming more mindful. And I think all of your books, contributions, and research that you've made to society has certainly provided guideposts on how to create a more meaningful life. And at the end of the day, that's what it's all about. Yeah. Meaning and yeah. fulfillment. Um, I'd like to part with, I'd like to part with this one last concept on my side at a higher level. When I look and I read a mindful body, although you may be referring to the mindful physical body, I think it applies to the body of a business. Yeah. The body of a business needs to be healthy and you can use these exact same guidelines and apply them to your business and it will increase productivity and success, overall success and abundance of everything and for everybody in the business. So, yeah, I think that's Dr. beautiful. Langer, I'd like to thank you again for another opportunity to talk and um, I wish you the best of luck in everything you do and I look forward to our next conversation. Me too. Thank you so much. Ted Wolf here. I want to thank you for joining us for this Implementers video. The Implementers podcast is presented by Guidewise, where we, along with our vetted member community, recognize that ideas are easy, but implementation is hard. To learn more about getting things done with Guidewise, please visit us at guidewise.io. And to conquer your implementation struggles, please like and share this video and subscribe to our channel. Happy implementing.